Hello, and welcome to The World at War. My name is Jeremy Isaacs. I'm the producer of the series, and I'd like to tell you something about how we made the episode you're going to watch now. You can't make bricks without straw, and it's not easy to make war films without pictures. But although millions of feet of film were shot during the Second World War, there's very little film of battles at sea. And for good reason. Some sea battles are fought at great distances, battleships shelling each other, though miles apart, and some are fought at night. It was at night that the German submarine fleets of Grand Admiral Dönitz torpedoed most of their victims. There's virtually no film of it. That made this film easily the most difficult to make of any in our series. So you'll notice that we make more use of diagrams and graphics in this than we usually do. And we sometimes use fast camera movements on still photographs to give the illusion of action footage. I hope you'll excuse it and allow those who served in the German U-boats and those who in the end contained them to tell their stories convincingly to you. Dönitz, a great naval commander, decided his killer U-boats should hunt in packs. We call this episode Wolf Pack. Ships and cargoes go down. Their crews, some of them, survive. But early in 1943, it is Britain's survival and the Allied hopes for victory over Germany, which are in doubt. When war began, Britain saw Germany's big ships as the main threat to her sea trade. So did the Germans. Germany's surface raiders would savage the merchant fleet on which Britain depended for much of her food, most of her raw materials and all of her oil. Germany's U-boats were to operate in coastal waters, sweeping up anything left by the battleships. Both Britain and Germany were wrong. The real naval menace was to be the U-boat. At least one man knew this, Karl Dönitz, chief of the U-boat arm. He could have been wrong too, if Hitler had delayed his war with Britain until all the battleships planned for the German Navy had been built. As it was, Dönitz was certain that with enough submarines, he could win the war at sea. He had proved it to himself 20 years before. In October 1918, I was uh, captain of a submarine in the Mediterranean near Malta. In a dark night, I met a British convoy with cruisers and destroyers. And I attacked and I sank a ship. But the chance would have been very much greater if there had been a lot of submarines. That's why the idea 
to uh, to uh, of a wolf pack to to put the submarines together that they could attack together was very uh, impressive and uh, that's why in all the years from 1980 until the year uh, 1935 where we had the first submarines again in the German Navy I never had forgotten this idea Underwater, the 1939 U-boat was slow. On the surface, it was faster than any convoy of merchant ships. With the slow silhouette, it could not be seen easily, especially at night. But its targets were outlined clearly against the sky. And with radio, the U-boats could quickly assemble into hunting packs. Dönitz knew Britain would try to protect her essential Atlantic trade by a system of convoys escorted by warships. To attack these convoys, Dönitz wanted 300 U-boats. When the war started, he had only 26. And these boats had long, dangerous voyages from base before they could reach their targets. When France fell, Dönitz gained new bases much nearer the shipping routes. His sea wolves returned to these French ports as heroes. One especial hero was Otto Kretschmer. In all, Kretschmer sank over a quarter of a million tons of British shipping. In October 1940, he joined the first real wolf pack. I remember that there was a signal that the convoy was coming in from America to England and um, that uh, its position was not known and uh, that Dönitz ordered all the submarines there to the west of Ireland to form a sort of uh, recce line, stationary recce line, to let the convoy pass through. And when the first the submarine which sighted, the convoy made a signal, its contact signal, this wrecker line was dissolved automatically and every boat was free to go in for the attack. Convoy SC-7 on the night of the 17th of October 1940 was passing Rockall. 34 merchantmen, four small escort ships. Seven U-boats attacked on the surface. The attack took the same form as that we were used to, which was a single ship being struck. Very shortly after that, a second one was struck. And then, within a matter of um, five to ten minutes, further ships were struck. I tried to get through the escorts into the convoy, which uh, was my own peculiarity of attacking, <laughs> and failed for the first time. They saw me and uh, shot star shells so that I had to draw away again. But for the second time I succeeded and was inside the convoy, going up and down the lanes and looking for the most important valuable ships, and had the opportunity to expand all torpedoes. I had 12 in all. I like to see ships in the various stages of sinking. A Dutch ship had stopped and was attempting to pick up survivors. And whilst I actually watched her doing this and was considering what to do about it, she also herself was torpedoed. Uh, this, along with another torpedo, um, set the whole place ablaze. That night, 17 merchantmen, exactly half the convoy, were sunk. The escorts had not been able to damage a single U-boat. I don't think I'd ever seen more than one ship sunk at a time before. And this was uh, something very different indeed. This really uh, was the first time that this tactics could be uh, experienced by all of us, and also by doing it himself, who of course knew it only from our peacetime training, 
And uh, the whole night, I think, was successful. It was called the night of the long, li long knives because so many ships were uh, sunk. In the first nine months of the war, Britain and her allies lost over two million tons of merchant shipping. In the next six months, with the U-boats operating from France, nearly two and a half million tons more went down. There were medals galore. U-boat crews called this the happy time. I saw the ship going up the stern, going underwater, and she right upended right up on end and went backwards. And I went down with her. After a bit, I came to the surface, and I was still sitting onto the overturned bridge boat, and I saw the submarine servicing. He went down and started picking up cases out of the water. General cargo, possibly uh, spirits, food, stuff, and so forth. They looked at us and circled around for a bit, they laughed at us and went away to the northeast. They never asked if we had any water, if we had any damages, or anything else. And we were left, floating amongst records in one boat. We're halfway between Brazil and North Africa. The only thing I could think about was trying to get to the land as near as possible, so I shut the course as near as I could to the northeast. All we had was the one lifeboat, which was made for 48 people. We picked up 58. There wasn't really room enough to sit up for anybody to sit down. The boat was leaking badly through being on the, on the chocks for some time. You had quite a bit of trouble getting the crew to move so you could bail, and you bailed for nearly two days until the wood, the wood of the boat started to swell and to tighten up. After that, it wasn't so bad. The worst days, of course, were when there was no wind absolutely uh, becalmed. The sun was terrific. So we started off by giving four ounces of water, two ounces in the morning and two ounces at night, and one biscuit. And there was a lot of noise in the boat. There were Chinese. And I said, what's all the bobbery? Which is a lot of talky-talky, you know? He said, I think uh, number one fireman go crazy. Hmm? Oh. So he eventually jumped over the side with a life jacket on. And after... A wee while, we got him back again. And later that night in the darkness, he jumped again. We didn't get him back because the sharks got him. On the morning of the 13th, I used to sit on the water barrel to make sure nobody could help themselves. And somebody shook me up and said, Hey, Captain, we see lights, green lights. Oh, I said, You're dreaming, you're dreaming. And I looked round and I saw some green lights. It looked to me like New Brighton Pier. I couldn't make it out. So I said, well, burn a flare. They burned a flare. She said, buy another, burn another flare. They burned another flare. And after a bit, I saw the green lights getting closer, more visible. Then after a bit, I saw a red light above the green. And then it dawned on me that it was a hospital ship. The U-boats had eyes in the air. Focke Wolf Condor aircraft could range a thousand miles out to sea to scout for convoys. When used to bomb shipping, the Condors sank 30 ships in two months. Luckily for Britain, this partnership with the U boat was never properly exploited. But Dönitz did exploit the fact that German naval intelligence had broken the British codes. We were aware that the intelligence for some reason was good, but I myself put this down to very superior hydrophone equipment that the submarines had, that the U-boats had in their boats, probably being able to pick up the, the noise of a convoy's propellers up to oh, 80 or even 100 miles. But in addition, I know that they would place their U-boats in a line across at right angles to the expected line of the convoy. And this line for, say, five U-boats could be a hundred miles from end to end. And so with good hydrophones, 
very little disguise of the position of a convoy could be affected. It was only after the war that we knew that they were breaking the codes and that they knew very well the time of leaving port that the convoys had and how many escorts were and how many merchant ships in each convoy. The Royal Navy, searching for U-boats underwater, had pinned its faith on ASDIC, an echo-sounding device. U-boats were attacking convoys on the surface. The Navy was not prepared for this. Convoy defence is not a very glamorous affair, and between the wars, I think rather naturally, the Navy in, were inclined to concentrate more on more glamorous activities, like great mass uh, torpedo attacks and that sort of thing. Uh, all the information about the lessons of World War I were available, and for those who wanted to read them, all the lessons were there. But I'm afraid no one bothered. And as a result, uh, trade defence as a whole was very badly neglected. The neglect continued. In the early days, convoys could only be escorted for about 300 miles from each Atlantic coast. There just weren't enough escort ships. Those available lacked endurance and their crews were virtually untrained. My officers were uh, three R&VR officers. One who was a civil engineer by profession. The, the other two were Canadian, several lieutenants, uh, both uh, of the age of between 20 and 21, who would uh, come from Canada as passengers, and that was their seagoing experience. The heads of department were regulars. Some of them had retired and called back. And there were two or three seamen who were of the Pucker service, and the rest were straight in. Air cover was to prove all important. But surprisingly, the Navy's carriers did not at first supply it. That task went to the RAF, although Coastal Command was ill-prepared. With the exception of the Sunderland flying boats, a very small number, all the other aircraft, except the Anson, were lash-ups. They were borrowed from entirely dissimilar functions in order to do this job in coastal command. Secondly, the navigation aids were not there. It was entirely dead-reckoning navigation. And whereas an experienced navigator can look at the sea and estimate the wind and where he's likely to be in an hour's time, this is very difficult for a, a new boy. And since the point to be navigated to, the convoy, was often